Jim Collison, we're live from the Heartland Developer Conference 2017. We're back here for day one. It's Thursday. I think it's uh, 11 o'clock, so we're doing the first sessions of interviewing. Courtney Heidemann's, Heidemann's with me. I was going to say Heidemann, <laughs> but I think that was our governor in Nebraska. Yes, that would be correct. Was it? Yeah. Now, I just call you trouble. Welcome. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Good to have good to have you here. Let's do. I know you really well. But that's because right. I work with you every day. But that's true. give me give me the give me the skinny on who you are, what you do for Gallup, that kind of stuff. Okay. So the better question is what I don't do for Gallup. <laughs> I have a lot of roles at, in our technology department. Uh, my primary role right now is a scrum master for our e-commerce team, which is pretty cool. I also. I'm a UX developer on the side. I do a ton of accessibility compliance specialist stuff. Um, me and Elizabeth Davies, who's also speaking at HTC this year, uh, just did a presentation about accessibility compliance and I kind of helped head her up on that. She, we, we joke that she is the person who gets to stand on the soapbox and I am the person that gets to do all the fun project management stuff. Nice. So for yeah. me, it's super fun. For her, she would rather be on her soapbox. So. It's good times. At Gallup, one of the beauties of being a Gallup employee is we just do tons of different jobs, yes. right? You get to kind of pick and choose sometimes. You yep. get to kind of, kind of. you talked about um, accessibility, right? In, yep. in Elizabeth's, uh, that's, you know, I don't know if a lot of people always think of that first Correct. in design, but it's super important. Why? Super important. So on average, about 20% of your users have some sort of disability that could be like what we're wearing right now this is a disability um you could have be one of the 12 percent of males who have color blindness you could be someone who's blind you could be someone who has parkinson's like it, it's a wide wide range of things and you really do have to like think about it from the very beginning because if you're building websites with accessibility in mind it's just going to make it so much easier to pass any of the certifications you have to pass. If you have a government contract, you have to be 508 compliant. That's our American one. And you have to go through this huge certification process with that and get it all tested and make sure everything works and fix things that don't. And if you build with accessibility in mind from the beginning, it's a whole lot easier to go back and fix the little things. Okay, so I'm a new startup. Yep. And I'm I, I'm all I've done it is write code, right? right? Yep. I'm just trying to get a functional product working. Right. And you say start with accessibility in mind. What would be a few things I might do or where would I go to kind of start thinking about that before we get too far? So there are two things that I would start with. When you are starting with your brand color palette, Gallup, if any of you have been to gallup.com, we have gray green. It's very hard to do color, co color contrast compliancy on it because it is two dark colors to two dark colors. And if you're red green colorblind, green shows up as gray, which makes it super fun. So when you're coming up with your first brand color palette, go through and do checkers on them. Like run it through a, a color blindness checker. There's a bunch of them on the web. You can Google them, find them. I would also run it through the web aim color contrast checker. You plug in two hex colors, the foreground and the background color, tells you how compliant it is. So that way you don't end up with an issue where you don't have very many colors that you can lay on top of each other. Um, that's the one of the first it things I would do. Could save you some time in the future of, like if you discover that early, yeah. then you can design oh, yeah. with that in mind going forward, yeah, right? Totally. And we have, uh, we at Gallup on our UX team, we have this chart that is, I don't know, we have eight and a half by 11s that are laminated as UX developers and designers. But you basically, we went through and matched all the foreground and background colors of the entire Gallup color palette. And it tells you what you can actually use with each other to have what level of compliancy. So that's one of the things that we have and it sits next to our desks and I look at mine pretty much every day. Okay, so, so. you talked about color blindness. Yep. What about in the areas of complete blindness? If I can't see, so what do I need to keep in mind? There's two tools that I would use for this. They're browser plugins. Um, there's one that's called Axe by DQ. It's D-E-Q-U-E -E is the company name. And you basically hit, anal you open up DevTools, hit analyze, and it'll run through your page and tell you what, how compliant your HTML is, if you're missing any color contrast issues, run it through every new feature you build. Just hit it, run it, see, see where you're at. Because if you only have two things to fix, that's gonna take you hopefully like five minutes 
and then it's not going to be a big deal five years down from the road when you're going to have to go, oh, we just signed a government contract. No. Yeah, and that's really where it's a big deal, right? Because the government, the U.S. government, yeah. puts a lot of uh, onus responsibility on the designers Correct. to make sure they're, it's done right. So yeah, yeah. What about uh, what about for those who are deaf or hard of hearing? So we use a plugin called Chromevox, which is a free screen reader. There's several different ones out there. You can Google them. Chromevox is really easy. It gets really annoying really fast because as someone who is a hearing person and not or a seeing person and isn't blind, it's a whole like you're not used to constantly hearing the screen reader read a website to you because you can see it. And so it's fun to turn it on and like go through your website and like, oh, this is how like blind people actually hear my website. Another big thing that we take into account is SEO. It's a blind user. Robots don't see your website. They don't care what your design looks like. They just want to know all the content and Google wants to know what's in your site so they can play in the right mm. search results for people. Right. Yeah, that's true. The, the crawlers are blind. Yeah. Uh, it, one of the things, uh, captioning pictures. Right, yep. I, I had even in my own blog, yep. I am guilty of just throwing a picture on. Yep. And then everyone is. You don't. You, and and you're like, oh, those alt tags right. are meaningless yep. for most people. Not for people who are using the the screen readers, nope. right? They Not they can all. see all yep. those. So those are super important, right? Yep. They they hear all of them, and then even Google reads through your alt tags and knows like if you have a giant picture up at the top. Like on Gallup.com, we have our giant featured article. That picture has certain text in it that helps us figure out where, helps Google figure out where yeah. to place I, that. Result. I didn't realize Google is also crawling the pictures. Yep. And so it's super important uh, to get that done. Would it be appropriate to leave a joke in the alt tag? <laughs> for Probably someone? not, but still funny. <laughs> yeah, you never know. Just, you know, something like this brightens someone's day. You know, so, something along those lines. Okay, what did you? What do you? What's your session on? So my session's on user journey mapping. Um, when I started at Gallup, shortly after I started, I started helping out with our usability uh, within Gallup, and I did a bunch of usability testing, and I grew into my Scrum master role and kind of left the usability testing to another person on our team, and I still have this like love of like understanding where the users are and figuring out the best best user experience for everything and as a scrum master it's a little hard to facilitate that sometimes and like you have you'll have issues coming from your client support or from a product owner or whatever and they're like users can't use our website and you have to kind of figure out how to like get the users can't use our website into something you can actually action on. Yeah. And so that's kind of what I'm talking about tonight. So what afternoon. are you, what are you hoping as people walking away? What's the one, cause you know, most people you're at a conference like this, you really only need to capture one or right. maybe two things. What, what are you hoping to really get across to them in your session? So I start off my, my presentations talking about personas and personas are like this giant massive process that people have to do. Like it takes you weeks, literal weeks to create a persona if you're doing it properly. I talk about this thing called empathy mapping, which takes you 15 minutes to create a persona. So I want you to be able to sit down in a room, gather like six to 10 people who know your users and create a persona so you know how to talk about Dave over here who's the user that you're walking through your site that you want to make sure that he has the best experience he can. So can you give me an example of like where you've done that in the past and it's really worked well? So uh -huh. one of the websites I work on at Gallup is our courses website. So yeah. if you want to come- I was come hoping you were going to talk about that, <laughs> by the way. So th I, didn't, I didn't set her up for this. I didn't <laughs> totally didn't. By we the way, didn't talk about this at all, if I you, promise. If you are listening live, we're not checking the chat in there. So I apologize <laughs> for that. But uh, so courses. So I work on our courses website. Uh, if a lot of people might not know Gallup sells courses. Um, you can come become a Clifton Strength certified coach if you want. We also do courses on hiring better teams and doing better management and all sorts of fun things. So I help manage that e-commerce site. And we had issues where users were coming to our first page and filling out all their registration details and clicking add to cart and not realizing that they still needed to input their credit card information because they hadn't done that because they get sent to this cart page and that's where they end up at. And so we're like, how do we solve this? And so we sat everyone down in a room, we had 
people who take answer phone calls and help people through the registration process, our product owner, people who actually talk to people at courses, our development team, the whole nine yards, sat down in a room, did this whole session. We created an empathy map. We did a user journey map, took us about two hours and came up with a ton of actionable items that were like, okay, this will solve, you know, yeah, tell tell me problem. more about this empathy map. I'm interested in like, so what does that actually look like? So uh, there's a bunch of different ways you can look at them. There's tons and tons of templates online. We use one where the name is up at the top and then you have a situation at the bottom. So in this course's instance, it might be whatever we decided to name the person is wants to become a Clifton Strengths coach. He wants to come take ASC or maybe one of our other courses to get on that path. Um, he decides that he doesn't really know what he wants. He's still kind of searching around. So you have that situation of like what the user is feeling at that moment. And then we do doing. So it's like where they're browsing around on the site, if they're like doing cost comparison, if they're looking at hotels and flights, because maybe they're not from an area that has a Gallup City Center or course location, um, what they're thinking and feeling. So they're like, ah, oh, this is going to be a lot of money. Am I going to get out of this what I want to get out of this? That kind of thing. And then doing thinking, feeling, and what they're seeing. Okay. So, And it's kind of more about the site and stuff. So Interesting. So it's, it's kind of like taking emotion into account through the user yep. experience. So it's not just about I go from A to B to the cart to hit submit, yep. but what's the actual and so you're getting feedback in this group yep. this empathy you're getting feedback how what are you feeling or what yep. potentially would you be feeling like and you're kind of tracking that experience yep. right and then saying okay how does the experience now that we know the feelings how do we create a workflow yep. or a whatever is that am i am i yep. close so you create that empathy map which is your persona so you can put yourself in that person's shoes and then you do this user journey map and you go through what actions people have to take, what questions, what pain points they might have. And it basically goes, oh, you know, I never thought that someone might need to know hotel information when they're looking at one of our courses locations because we might have partner hotels in that city center area. And we're like, oh, you get like, you know, $20 discount if you go stay at this hotel. Something you might not realize, but when you're sitting in a room and you're like, oh, as a user, like, I totally want to know that. Yeah. And so you figure it out and you figure out what action items you need to take and create different pieces of usability yeah. on the website. How, how do you know? So you, you collect this empathy map, you begin to make roadmap changes to what you're doing and try to change the user experience in a way that it's more appealing to them. How do you know it's working? Like, how do you track that in a way that's meaningful? So since I work on e-commerce, it makes it really easy because you see a revenue growth. <laughs> that's super easy. We also do a lot of unmoderated remote testing. Um, we There's a bunch of different websites out there that you can use. Uh, Usertesting.com, TryMyUI, there's a couple other ones. Um, and basically you'll pay. Um, Nielsen and Norman say that if you have five users, you'll find 80% of the problems on your site. Well, you go through this, you kind of fix up your site and you want to see where you're at. Pay to have five users do a 15 minute test on your site. You write up a test plan, you go, hey, go through, purchase a course, blah, 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 blah. And you'll actually get to see user screens and like where their mouse is clicking and like they talk to you through it and they're like, I have no idea what I'm doing right now. And you know that that's an issue. So. And then you got to come back yeah. around and try out some new, do, uh, do you go back in and try out kind of a couple different, like, it's okay, someone's struggling in this area. Yep. Do you present some some different options to see which one is you the best? You totally can. That's called A-B testing in our world. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways you can do that. There's one called Optimizely. Google has their own and Google experiments. Um, and you go through and you're like, oh, hey, I want to like try this headline compared to this headline and that stuff. And you'll start to see a clear winner of people who are getting that call to action that you want from there. I asked this for, we had the keynote here and one of his areas is, is virtual reality and voice yep. assistance. We were talking about those. Um, I, want, I want your take on this. So in the, in the UX UI world, we often talk about the screen. Yep. And we're moving into a world of voice assistance where there is no screen. Does the testing like that change? Does it become different or have, have you done any thinking along the lines of how do we take that user experience? Is it different or is it just the same thing except it's just voice? I think it's going to be an interesting experience um, because 
to tie back to accessibility, what happens if you, you're hard of hearing and you're designing a voice app? Yeah. Like, how are you going to make that work? And so you have that usability wise, like you're going to have to, we're going to have to figure out different ways of testing. Right now, we just have companies that we can pay money and they have a whole user bank of people and they, they're like, here, you find people are going to take this test for us. We're going to have like, vid, like true auditory experiences. We don't really have that prepped for yet. So it'll, it'll be an interesting market. I definitely see people breaking into there. Yeah. I, I'm doing some interesting thinking. That sounds a little self-serving. <laughs> But I'm uh, doing some interesting thinking about the tie-in between audio and, and, and text. Yep. And, of course, what we do on the podcast is we create all this audio that people listen to. We want it searchable. We want it indexable. I also yep. want to be able to get people right to the spot where we say things. It's still an incredibly hard process to get that done. But yep. I do see this in, this tie-in between the, the text, the visualization uh, totally. pieces, yep. and a signature Yep. And then our voice creates a signature, right? Correct. And as we're getting better at understanding when I say something at the computer, understanding it, I think we're going to get to a point too where those voice commands yeah. become a signature of sort. I think no, context I is important and some of those you, other things. You even see that in like the Amazon Echo right now and like the Google Home and that type of atmosphere where you have a point where like you and your significant other roommate, whoever lives with you, each have a different voice signature on the the like Amazon Echo is the really good one. And they'll be like, Amazon, can you purchase X for me? And they'll go through and they know which person's purchasing it and routing it through the right account and shipping address, all of that. Yeah. So thank you for not saying the catch word, by the way. You said Amazon and yeah. not the A the other A word. Because <laughs> and then thank you for not saying a product. Because <laughs> yes. I've listened to podcasts where people say that and then all of a sudden your device is right. purchasing uh purchasing something for you. Uh, yes. Courtney, in the space that you're in, last question, in the space that you're in, if you could fix one problem today that is still a big issue for what's going on in the industry, what, what would you fix? That's a good question. I think just doing more accessibility testing in general, uh, you see a lot, a lot of issues with it on the web. And it's like the new in thing. Um, I do a lot of work with Gallup contracts and we have a lot of people coming through asking about it. And there's been a couple of big lawsuits recently. If you're in the Omaha area, Omaha Stakes is getting hit with a accessibility lawsuit right now. Um, there was a big one in the Southeast district for Winn-Dixie um, because they had a radio ad that was like, hey, we have, coupons, more coupons on the website, like come check it out. And the coupons weren't screen reader accessible. And so that was a big thing. And I think taking accessibility into account is going to, it's, it's coming. It's, it's going to be the next big thing. I do believe. Yeah. Do you think I said one more question, but let me ask you one more because I'm that kind of guy. <laughs> There's at, always one more Gallup, question, right? At Gallup, <laughs> we ask a lot of questions. It's, it's, what, we, it's what we do. Um, do you think we'll ever be to a point where there can be some health, some self healing or some self-directing UI that or UX that changes. So I'm uh, you, I'm going to send this out for user testing yeah. and nobody does it like the users do, right? Right. Where I can start getting that instant feedback instead of it being weeks or maybe even days, but I begin to really see and getting that instant feedback from the users. Does that exist today or are, are we to at a an spot? Extent, um, there's companies that do usability testing as Facebook the, being yeah. one of them. Yeah. yeah. There's companies that do have this philosophy that you can have do a whole usability test in a day. You can come into the office at 8 a.m., you write your usability test, you put it on one of the websites that tests your five users for you, you go out to lunch, you come back, your results are there, you watch all of them, you gather all the information, you put all your data together and you realize what the actual problems are and then call it a day. And so I think it, it's getting there. It's getting faster yeah. and faster and faster. And as long as you have the right people thinking the right questions and the right use cases, I would just think there. thousands of users. Like if I if say I have a pretty popular website and I'm someone's going through my store and they're struggling, and it, it would be I think it would be awesome if I began to get alerts that yeah. said, "Hey, this isn't working right." And right. this is the spot it's not working. And you could begin to write up, change, deploy, and then in real time, watch to see if that change is fixing yeah. things. So maybe a little AB in that moment. Okay, we're I still going to cool. do that. I mean, think about um, think about how that, yeah, I'm, I'm Italian right. all of a sudden. <laughs> 
We're uh, both hip talk. People I know. We're woo. We're high woo. So but I'm not. You are. But I, it's that's fine. That's true. <laughs> You lie. Uh, but I think there would be some great opportunities for this this concept. And I think Facebook does a lot of this where they deploy it, test it in yep. real time. Yep. And then pull it if it's disaster. Yep. Pull it if it tells them some things, then maybe merge it or change it or come up with some. Yep. Where I'm almost getting daily or even hourly uh, customizations or optimizations to my U, to my UX or my Netflix yeah. is another one that does that a lot. Um, you'll notice even in certain sections of the Netflix app, they'll have they might be pushing like a little a little itty bitty section of the Netflix app out as a release, and they'll remove it from the app for about five minutes, and then all of a sudden it'll be back, and you'll you'll notice it. You'll be like, I was really looking for the comedies category, and it'll be gone. Yeah. And then five minutes later, you're like. What? what? <laughs> it just wasn't there, and now it is. I think we're seeing more of that, and and I think that I think yeah, you got to be too. faster in picking up this in real time and almost doing some analytics against yep. it that says, "Hey, your users are struggling. Yep. If you did this, yeah. it would like this is the choke point." Yeah, you know, I so. definitely see it. There's a lot of traffic analysis going on that you can you can tie traffic analysis through using Google Analytics or whatever you're using, and usability and you like tie it all together into a nice neat package of what you need to yeah. fix yeah so no good it'll Courtney, be interesting thank you for taking the time you're it always welcome. goes Thanks so fast good to have you on here if you're if you're watching uh, the video now and there's a handful of you that are we're going to start the next video in just a few minutes it's right below this one so just look down there on the live page or maybe you caught us on youtube if you got us on youtube siliconprairienews.com slash live we'll get you there as well so we'll be back here in just a few minutes with the video right below us courtney thanks